Welcome to the Tiger Performance Podcast, where we feature high-achieving entrepreneurs and coaches and share their performance journeys. Now, let's get started with the show. Steve Adams here, founder and CEO of Tiger Medical Institute. I'm the host of the Tiger Performance Podcast, where I interview thought leaders and experts about their specialized knowledge they can offer the world to help us all live better. It's time to acknowledge our sponsor for today's episode, which is the Tiger Medical Institute. Our focus is on the mid-career dental professional, C-suite executive and entrepreneur, many of whom are depleted and not showing up as the best version of themselves. The Tiger System is a personalized root cause approach to health optimization. The Tiger System is a one-year health transformation journey empowering you to experience the best possible health to achieve the goals and experiences in life you want most. Visit TigerMI.com today to learn more. All right, we have a fun guest today, RuPaul Pytel. And let me read this backstory. And for all of you who've been listening, you're going to laugh because of what my dream job has always been. So I'll tell you about that in a minute, RuPaul. Mm -hmm. Um, After a thrilling career at the CIA, she started her first six-figure business from scratch almost 10 years ago, combining the business savvy gained along the way With her CIA training, she now helps startup founders, corporate leaders, and innovation-focused organizations think bigger, lead better, and be bolder. Leveraging her Ivy League education, MBA degree, and CIA training, RuPaul combines an industry-leading theory with tactical experience to engage everyone from boardroom executives to bootstrapping founders. RuPaul's work on identity-driven leadership helps new and seasoned leaders delve deep into their identity so that they can leverage their unique strengths, uncover their blind spots, and become better, more effective, and more fulfilled in the process. Her powerful perspectives on resilience, adaptability, mindset, and growth are invaluable for teams, leaders, and changemakers who want unconventional insights to help them think bigger, lead better, and be bolder. RuPaul, thank you for joining the Tiger Performance Podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure, Steve. Thank you for having me. You are welcome. Um, Just a little warm-up one. Tell us about your family. (laughs) Gosh, well, I I could, and I probably at some point will write a whole book about my family, but um, I am one of those lucky people who has a wonderful, tight-knit, and very large family. So I am one of four. I've got a sister and two brothers. I um, have many, many cousins who we grew up as siblings uh, with mm-hmm. each other. And uh, I've, I've had really, really wonderful parents who were both very uh, career-focused and very um, family-focused, mm-hmm. but also always instilled in us this idea of giving back um, at every step of the way, no matter how much or how little you have to always help those um, that you were in a position to help. So yeah, really. That's awesome. Are they all over the world or because you're in London, correct? I am. Yeah. Sadly, I'm the only one who, who is. So (laughs) uh, my, the, my immediate family, so siblings, parents, et cetera, live in New York and then the rest of my family is almost all in Chicago. So oh, wow. I am the, and we've got some smattered through Ohio and Indiana, but the the two big clusters are in New York and Chicago. New York and Chicago, yeah. I I lived in Michigan my whole life until recently, okay. in Florida yeah. now. But uh, um, Chicago is a great city. Been there many times. Yes. 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 Yeah. So tell us, yeah, you know, we're going to delve into it more in, from your book, but. Um, delve into what was it like growing up in, in Brooklyn, right? Um, Staten Island. Staten Island. Okay. Yep. Um, in your family, just tell us what, what that was like growing up and what, what did you take away from your mom and dad that um, showed up later in the CIA and in your business that you have today? Uh, so growing up was a bit complicated. I mean, I think everybody has, well, maybe not everybody, I shouldn't speak for others, but it felt at the time like it was very complicated. I always felt like I was straddling lots of different worlds. So, you know, I have a very strong Indian cultural heritage, but also mm-hmm. very, very American. Yep. Uh, we feel even particularly more American living here in, in the UK now. Yes, um, okay. You know, I 
I got um, a very private and introverted side to me, but I'm also a very social person. I, you know, grew up in a world where I just always was very aware of how I didn't fit as opposed to mm-hmm. how I might fit. And so, and, and I think some of that might be temperament because to be honest, with the benefit of hindsight and maturity and life experience, et cetera, you know, looking back on the things that I felt really angsty about and, you know, not being one of the cool kids or the popular mm-hmm. kids and all of mm-hmm. those things, it didn't really matter because I have always had great people in my life, really good friends, really, uh, really uh, sort of uh, supportive friends, as well as my wonderful extended family. And so I think a lot of what felt at the time like, oh, it's so hard and I don't fit in and I don't feel um, like there's a a tribe of people like me out there. Mm -hmm. Some of it was perhaps, like I said, just sort of a temperamental thing um, because looking back, I think, wow, well, actually, you know, some of those moments where I felt like I was a bit alone and I didn't have any anybody else, I still did have some really great people around me, again, friends and family members. So it was, yeah, it was complicated, uh, to say the least. And, um, but it was also really, really enriched and really mm-hmm. enriching because, uh, you know, as I shared, uh, well, have half shared in the book, you know, my parents were and still are very driven, very community focused and very uh, excellence focused. And mm-hmm. that often translated into them just setting really, uh, well, I won't say high expectations, but having, well, yes, I guess maybe having high yes. expectations for for what me and my siblings could do and should do. Um, and that was actually really nice. You know, a lot of people talk about, oh, especially, you know, the stereotypes of, of Asian immigrant parents and uh, Indian American parents, you know, always sort of browbeating their kids. It never felt like that. It, it was always you know, we would go through that stereotypical conversation of like, oh, you know, you only got a 98 out of 100 on this test. (laughs) What happened to the other two points? But I never took that as a, oh my gosh, my best is never good enough. It was always, and the way they they asked that question wasn't like, oh, well, you know, we want you to be perfect all the time. It was more, and that was the question they then asked was, could you have done better? You know, why did understand why you missed out whatever number of points you missed out on? Did you prepare? Did you let yourself down? And again, sort of instilling that uh, that that discipline and that habit of always at least trying your best and always trying to see what you are made of and what more you could bring to the table next time. If you did leave Mm -hmm. something behind, you know, in in whatever it was in in a sporting event or in a test or or anything like that. So. Yeah, there was this real culture of excellence and and always trying to improve both yourself, but then also always trying to improve the world around you. Um, and that that stays with me even now. You know, I brought it with me, of course, you know, when I went and started my slightly sort of meandering uh, <laughs> early career, or I should say non-traditional career. Sure. Um and even now, you know, my the, the the most important questions I ask myself is, you know, what could I have done differently? What could I have done better if mm-hmm. something, you know, is is other than what I was hoping for it to be? And also the the importance of asking the question why, you know, really mm-hmm. understanding both the fundamentals of anything we do, whether in a professional capacity or in, you know, or interpersonal relationships or whatever, but really mm-hmm. understanding the fundamentals and the logic behind things mm-hmm. so that you could always. Uh, operate from that really solid foundation of understanding. You know, I when I was reading your book, you talk about Astoria when you didn't make valedictorian, you were the second place person. Yeah. <laughs> that story, I think, illustrates that your parents did it right because the way you process that. Now, obviously, you were mad and all that because you're 17, yeah. you're not super mature <laughs> at that age. Yeah. I mean, you're more mature than boys were, but because uh, boys are not mature until like 40. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but, uh, uh, just that story, though, of how, you know, you do you talk about in your book, you know, it's not what happens to you is how do I frame it? How do I yeah. process it? And yeah. and you did that in a way that was like, you know, you wanted excellence. You know, my dad, I was raised in the same kind of a home. Yeah. Uh, my dad went from uh, he was the fourth kid in his family, first one to graduate high school mm-hmm. and ended up at General Motors and had several thousand people working for him. He developed himself into a great leader. And he used to always tell me that I have very high expectations for all of my people. And I watch them work really hard to live up to them. 
Exactly. And, to, and then I expect excellence until they prove otherwise. I don't look at yeah. them the other way. So that's really what you're saying you grew up in. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I think, you know, human beings, we're really, really good at rising or falling to expectations, yes. you know, and it's not, right. you and I were lucky to grow up in an environment where that was what we, what we knew, but, you know, they've done psychological studies on, on small children, you know, where they'll yeah. tell a group of five-year-olds and separate them into two groups and say, okay, well, you guys are the superstars and the really smart ones. And you guys are the, the average students, even though they're exactly the same to begin with. And then the superstars perform at a higher level yeah. and the average kids stay average, you know? And so we are, like I said, we rise or fall to the expectations set out before us. And I think there's no harm in setting the bar high because even if you miss, at least you've gotten higher than you would have if you set it really, really low. Sure, sure, right. So, um, you know, uh, on our pod, on this podcast, I ask everybody. The last question I ask them is, "What is your fantasy career?" Yeah. And uh, and so you can think about that for the next forty minutes. And yeah. uh, um, and it's not about regrets or anything like that. It's just like, what would be super fun if I could do this parallel life while I'm living the one I'm living now? Yeah. And the one that I always I tell people that I have two. One is would have been to be a Division One basketball coach in the U.S. Okay, so nice. I coached basketball for fifteen years. I'm pretty good at it, uh, right. but it just didn't it didn't work out. I couldn't pursue that. Um, but the other one was I wanted to be a CIA agent. So that's why, yeah. So that's why it was so fun when I saw this book and I'm like, I've got to get her on my podcast. I have to. And uh, because I've only met one other one when I used yeah. to live in DC, I met one who was retired and, yeah. um, and, uh, and what was interesting was I had a, I had a, uh, a guest one time ask me, do you think that it shows up somewhere in your life? And I'm like, wow, I never thought of that. And, yeah, I did coach basketball 15 seasons mm -hmm. while I was running my business. But also, um, I started a micro lending nonprofit like 20 years ago. And I go to places like Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, and Gosh. you know, Tashkent, Uzbekistan, and Baku, Azerbaijan, and Tbilisi, wow. Georgia, and southern Russia, which I couldn't go to now. And I've been to Ukraine eight times. And I've been to um you know, and my organization were in Indonesia and China. And I started thinking, you know, in some ways that has showed up in my life because yeah. these aren't places normal people go from the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> no, <fair laughs> not. And that's a really great question, actually. I've never I've never heard it phrased that way. But I think that was a brilliant question that your guest asked you. And and, and clearly it has shown up. It has. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, it ends up showing up in a lot of my guests that I asked the question too. Yeah. I mean, they may not always be able to process it right live on the podcast, but later they're like, Hmm, and then they'll write me a little email and, and say, thanks for that. Um, yeah. But uh, so my, the, the reason I brought that up was why the CIA, RuPaul? Am I saying your name right, RuPaul? Uh, so, no, it's RuPaul. RuPaul. Okay. I'm sorry. Yep. That's okay. Thank you for yep. asking. Um, mm -hmm. So why the CIA? To be honest, it was a no brainer. It was, uh, it was someone asking me to pay me to do the things that I love, which is get really smart about a topic, really delve right. into the details and understanding, you know, why things are the way they are or why our relationship with the, another country is what it is or why, you know, certain things are happening in the world the way they're unfolding. Right. And also, you know, paying me to learn languages, to travel and to to inform foreign policy, all of which were like, wow. you could not have written a better job description for for me. You know, I've studied political science, international affairs. I, I'm, I'm definitely a nerd. I love learning. I love studying. Yep. I love understanding things. I love learning languages and living overseas. Yep. And so every single one of those things when I was like, someone's going to actually give me money to do these things. Yes, please. You know, yes. it really was. It was an absolute no brainer. And, you know, the experience, it's never too late, Steve, but uh, the experience yeah. was. I don't know, they'd take somebody my age. I am learning Russian, though. So, hey, there you go. There yeah. you go. You never know. Um, but yeah, it lived up to every single one of those expectations. Ah. It really was. I mean, I remember having, you know, many conversations with my dad while I was still there about how. I would wake up genuinely excited to go to work. That's and cool. that was, you know, that's such an amazing feeling, which I would, and, and he said it to me at the time. He's like, if you have found that thing, then don't ever let it go. You know, that mm -hmm. is really yeah. special. 
and and uh so and did the how do the movies depict it at all remotely close or is it like way off i mean it's not way off but it's there's a lot of questionable dramatization but then again there's a lot of stuff that the movies can't begin to capture because i mean we do and did some amazing quite literally mind-blowing things and so yeah i think they get stuff of it. Huh? exactly well you can't exactly right. <laughs> so yeah. hollywood has to take liberties and i would say you know i think they get they get it I, I won't even give it a percentage. They get some things very right and they get some things very wrong. Um, and then everything else is just Hollywood sort of throwing in right. you know, sort Mix of and, story. and excitement and all of that stuff. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. It, right. Well, that's really interesting. So, so, I mean, how do you, when you look back on your time that you were at the CIA, how, how did that shape who you are now into the person that wrote this book and does the coaching that you do? I think fundamentally it was that real mindset shift of nothing is impossible and you know facing physical challenges uh sort of geographic challenges intellectual challenges mission related challenges and the response was always a unanimous can-do attitude towards how are we going to find a way around this because as you know again from hollywood but also reality very rarely do things go to plan. And we are dealing with very naughty, complex situations where it takes both physical as well as mental resilience and adaptability and all of those things. And just being immersed in a culture where it was never a question of, oh, well, we can't do that. It was always a question of, well, how could we do that? You know, given the situation we're in right now, given the realities yeah. on the ground, given the resources we have accessible, it's a, it's sort of that MacGyver mentality, right? So yeah, right. That just do whatever you can with what you've been given and don't give up until, you know, you're, you decide when you give up as opposed to letting circumstances decide that. So that it's almost like an indomitable sort of, can do, uh, you know, nothing is impossible sort of uh, mindset. That was, I mean, it was just an incredible experience because that for me is the one thing that is universally applicable, yes. whether in a corporate organizational setting or even in a personal context where, yes, all of us at every stage, at every level of fame and fortune and success and, and all of those things, everybody faces challenges and obstacles and difficulties yep. and hurdles. But it's what, you know, it's become a cliche now. It's, you know, but what do you do with that that separates those who succeed and keep going and achieve their ambitions or their dreams or whatever it is, and those who just are still talking about it and moaning about how difficult mm-hmm. life is and, you know, woe is me kind of thing. So I think that was just, yeah, it was a great, great training in just being indomitable and relentless until you decide otherwise. You know, the, the <clears throat> I just mentioned my nonprofit a minute ago. We, I think we've started over 250 businesses in these developing wow. countries. And the, the traits that we look for are <clears throat> that ability to remain resilient and adaptable uh, and optimistic. I think because that, because anybody that's been in business, the 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 adversity just stacks. Oh God! And, 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 <laughs> yes, it does. It does. And, and it's literally, it's like I heard one speaker say it. What are you willing to do that everybody else in the world is unwilling to do? Yeah. And, yeah. and it's probably similar in there. And, and also, you probably had to learn a lot of rigor too, because if yeah. you didn't apply rigorous thinking, you get killed. Exactly. Somebody gets yeah. killed. Right. Yeah, 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 exactly. And again, it goes back to that fundamental uh, sort of immersion again that I got from my parents that constantly questioning and constantly trying to understand the root causes of something, the fundamentals that that very sort of engineering mindset, right, where yes. you you really have to go back to first principles yep. and then everything is built upon that. And yeah, that, that the combination of those two, that sort of uh, relentless or, or resilience as w- combined with the that rigor. Um, that will see you through every and anything in any context. It will. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's shift to your book. Um, the, uh, was it hard to get this cleared? I always hear that. It wasn't. It wasn't. No, do you know everyone? I, well, I don't know what other people think. I have gone through the, there's just a process, you know, you have to submit the manuscript and then 
the the people at the review board will look it over and of course you know ask you to redact anything that could be seen as classified but they're so reasonable they're and they're nice. so easy to work with i have had nothing but good experiences with it so sadly there's no drama here there was just I no, I they made very minor uh uh redactions and i mean literally there was like small changes that no one would <laughs> notice um and then and then we went on so oh, yeah nice. was well awesome. and you weren't telling stories about what you were doing either you were mo- yeah. you're, you're talking principles that uh, exactly that, that track across transcend profession exactly. yeah exactly. so that's cool so let's yeah. um um let's uh talk about uh the right up front you deal with identity mm. and identity identity driven leadership um mm-hmm. can you tell us why you dealt with that right up front and and uh, maybe a little bit how do you how do you help pull that pull that together for a client of yours and help yeah. them get get that right inside them um, yeah. Because there's there's got to be a downside if they don't. Yeah. So I think a lot of it really was born of my own experience. You know, like I said earlier, where I, you know, felt always in conflict and like I never fit. And again, you know, where I, like I said, sort of there was cultural sort of tension sometimes and internal tensions and um, also what people expect someone who looks like me to, you know, how I, you know, what those expectations are, et cetera. And so sure. I've always just been very aware of the many facets of who I am and how I've had to juggle them in the various contexts I've operated in. And then I, you know, I realized that so much of what happens from a young age, but even as we grow, grow into adults and leaders, et cetera, is that we buy into stereotypes and archetypes that we have received from popular culture or from our families or from friends or all of these different influences. And they're, they're total rubbish because let's face it, you know, I'll give a very sort of glaring example. Oftentimes when people hear the word CEO, they think of, you know, a man, a middle-aged man, six foot something tall, wearing a suit. Well, yeah, but wearing a suit, no offense. Um, And, you know, know, somebody's very aggressive and very shouty and very just sort of, alpha male. And that, in my experience, has maybe been 50% of the leaders, CEOs that I've ever met, if if even that high. And yet, because we're constantly bombarded with this idea of what a leader looks like and how they behave and how they're supposed to act and all of these things, people feel that they either have to conform and become someone they're not, which creates a whole other tension in and of itself, or they just, they hold themselves back because they say, oh, well, you know, I'm a woman. I don't like to shout. I don't wear suits, whatever it is. I'm not alpha. I'm not, you know, white and middle-aged, whatever. And then they, they opt out without even having given it a go or without even considering or having seen examples that don't conform to that, to that, that alleged norm. And so I think there's just a lot of nonsense that people, we all, we all sort of, and again, I'm speaking from personal experience where I have yeah. felt that tension of like, oh, well, you know, someone who is a leader has to t- put on certain airs, or if you reach a certain level of wealth, then all of a sudden you can't shop at, I don't know, uh, you know, Macy's or whatever, yeah, you know, right. you, have to, you have to become a totally different human being. And that's just total nonsense. Like that is just not reality, yeah. but I think too many people buy into it and then hold themselves back or again, try to force fit themselves into a mold that doesn't fit. And that does not serve anyone because it robs the world of a huge richness of potential leaders, you know, wealth creators, role models, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And so that is why for me, it all has to start with unpacking who you are, who you care, what you care about, what your values are, and how you as an individual want to lead and how you see leadership for yourself. And then seeing what, how we can bring that into the real world. So that, again, yeah. there's a greater diversity and richness of the types of leaders. And I don't mean just from a demographic diversity perspective, right. but mm-hmm. personality diversity, mm. you know, sort of introversion, extroversion, all of that stuff, because why are we leaving so many people out of the game effectively uh, by telling everyone we have to conform to this one this one mold? So that's why for me it's so important because it, mm-hmm. it again it creates um, a, just better working environments, but it also 
creates better leaders because then you can be authentic and you can be who you are and you can lead in a way that is sustainable for you. You're, you know, you're less likely to burn out if you're not feeling like you're an imposter pretending to be somebody else every day. Right. You, and I think it's, again, it's just a sustainable and a better way to lead. And I think for too long, people have have really tried to be someone they're not because they reached a certain mm-hmm. level or they want to you know, apply for a certain job. And like I said, that doesn't serve anyone. So for me, it really, again, going back to first principles, who yep. are you? You know, what is important to you? How are your values going to show up in your career, in the way you lead, in whatever it is? And then let's look at how we're going to integrate that very practically into your day-to-day working environment. It's not to say that everybody has to all of a sudden, you know, um, that it's not like a big free-for-all where everything goes and anything goes. But again, understand who you are and then let's build on that. And if you try to lead not doing that, you have all of this internal dialogue going on, exactly. the stress, and then you yes. don't lead authentically in your voice. Yes. Um, you know, I started, I mean, I had leadership roles as young as sports because I was like a captain of these sports yeah. teams and stuff like that and played football and, and at the university level. But uh, the my first real leadership role in corporate America was kind of in my mid-20s. Uh, mm-hmm. I was, I got into the banking industry and I was in the retail branch administration. Yeah. And then, then I moved into corporate lending. And then by 30, I was back in a leadership role. And, uh, I can tell you from personal experience, you know, it took me probably because I didn't have a coach like you who could help me figure it out. So, mm-hmm. uh, 30 to 45 years old, there was about yeah. a 15 year period. Now I'm not saying I was completely ineffective. I was effective, but I kind of hit my stride in my mid forties. Like these are, this is who I am. This is my voice. This is, uh, cause I was trying not to be that typical CEO because I'm, I'm somewhat gregarious, but I'm, I'm as much an introvert as I am an extrovert. And I'm like you, I want, I nerd out. I want to go deep on something. (laughs) I like to travel and all these weird things that, you know, and I'm, and I'm not uber competitive. Like most CEO stereotypes are, you know, win at all costs. So it took a while to sort all that out, but I will tell you, I'm 58 now and the last 13 years have been amazing from a leadership thing. Yeah. 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 And I think every generation has to learn the lesson. Well, and I think for me, part of the reason, again, I think maybe there is just a a, a shift that happens when one reaches sort of late thirties, early forties, because that's when it started happening for me as well, that acceptance and and real appreciation for who I am. And instead of constantly battling against it and trying to make it fit to to actually double down on my strengths and what makes me who I am and how I tick, as opposed to feeling like I need to fit another mold. And I think if I can help anybody short circuit that process, and instead of, you know, wasting 15 years of their life going through that agony, if we can cut it down, you know, to five years or no years, then that is going to be so much better for everyone. And, and it's not just this, you know, aspirational thing of like, oh, it sounds really great. There are real physical consequences to living in tension oh. with yourself. And, you know, as you know, again, and I, you know, we can all probably name more examples than we'd like to of people who have burnt out of who've, you know, gotten stress related heart conditions or given mm-hmm. themselves, you know, sort of, and you work in the health field. So you see it, you know, we see it every day with our every yep. day, yep. people quite literally making themselves sick and, and getting themselves to an early grave because there is all of that internal tension that has not been able to be processed in a, or redirected or or transformed in any you know more productive way, and so this is you know this is about like, again without sort of sort of making it uh, sound a bit overblown, it's about saving people's lives quite literally sometimes. It is, it is, and you know, so identity is a big one, and another one that distracts leaders is this idea of looking to the left and to the right yeah. instead of straight ahead. <laughs> I want to, I love your dad's advice. He says, live an absolute life, not a relative life. And talk about that. Um, (laughs) Talk about this idea of running your own race. It's in your book. I love that. That was the most part I I underlined. I love that part. I literally, even just hearing you say that my dad's quote again, gives me chills because it is one of the hardest things to do. And you and I, we both are really love our sports. And, you know, I, I love using sports analogies as well. And this idea of running your own race, because too often we're distracted by 
everyone around us. What are other people in my industry doing? What are people who graduated from my alma mater doing? You know, what are people my age making? Where are they living? Yeah, are they right. Am I behind or ahead? Exactly. Yeah. And and this, you know, and I refer to it in the book as uh, comparisonitis because I do think it is a bit of a disease and 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 it can really again, sidetrack us from what is important to us. And this constantly measuring ourselves by other people's standards has, is maybe we care about those things, but maybe we don't, you know, and we're just mm-hmm. sort of, yeah. or shouldn't or, or whatever it is. And, and, and that's, again, it's a very personal choice, what you care about and what you don't. But I think for me, it comes back to questioning, well, why have, you know, anytime I tell, find myself telling myself I should do something, you know, it's that idea of why do I feel I should do it? Is it, coming from an internal source, like, you know, my values, the things I care about, my ambitions, my dreams, or is this a message that I got from a family member, a friend, a community, or whatever it is? And so I think the reason, you know, I focus as much as I do on on unpacking where all those those messages come from mm-hmm. is so that we can see and start to interrogate, well, is this coming from me? Is this actually important to me? And should I keep pursuing it? Or is it not? And this is just a distraction. It's comparisonitis. It's, you know, yep. looking all around and it's not useful. And I need to refocus myself because in a business context, we often are looking, oh, well, this is the benchmark. This is the industry standard. This is the SOP. This is the best practice. And that might work for some companies, but it might not work for yours. It might work for some leaders, but it might not work for you. And again, it goes back again and again to always asking why. Why is this best practice? Why is this the SOP? Why am I comparing myself to others? And instead of getting mired in how, you know, we don't measure up, I think another way of flipping it is, okay, fine. You know, human beings will compare. That's what we do. We like to sort of measure ourselves in in, in relation to other people. And from time to time, it just happens. But instead of just wallowing in that place of like, oh, we're, we're behind or we're not doing this or we're not doing that. I again like to flip it and say, okay, well, how can we make this productive? How can what can we learn from that company who's miles ahead? What have they done differently? Is it in a process? Is it in hiring? Is it in training? Is it in customer sure. deliver? What you know? Again, understand the fundamentals, and then see if it's still relevant because they might just have billions more to invest in something than yeah. you do, or have yeah. a. 15 year track record that's longer than yours or whatever it is. But again, it's getting back to the fundamentals, understanding the why, and then more often than not, just refocusing on that running your own race and living an absolute life instead of the relative one where you're constantly comparing because businesses do this all the time where they forget that often it's already stuff that they have that they're just not using effectively you know they're not that and and they don't need to compare they don't need to go external for best practice or for ideas they just need to do what they do better so get really clear on what they do what they stand for what they care about what they're delivering and then just get better at that you've already got the customer base you've already got you know fans or whatever you want to call them so who cares what the others are doing Focus on what you can do to to make your company better. Yeah, excellent. You know, um, when I first got into business in my early 30s, I had I was obsessed with my competitors, PetSmart and Petco, because I was in a pet superstore mm-hmm. chain. And uh, and the thing I realized about that, first of all, it makes you sick because you're constantly worrying, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, so and also every minute you're thinking about them, you're not thinking about your strategy. Exactly. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, the better version of me 20 years later, when this me- Tiger Medical started, you know, I had people like, you're really going to do that? There's Mayo, there's Cleveland, there's Johns Hopkins, there's all. And I'm like, I don't care. I'm, I did the whole blue ocean strategy map and created something that was completely different and unique from them yeah. so that I can just focus on that, not worry about what they're doing. Exactly. And, uh, it just, it calms you down and focuses you. Well, and also, let's face it, everything has been done before. Every, you know, every idea has been had. Every song has been written. Every great story has been in any capacity, in any field of endeavor. In some way or another, everything has been done before, right? So it's what are you going to do to make it yours? Because they haven't heard it from you. They haven't seen it your way. And, you know, I think Apple is a fantastic example of this. They didn't invent the portable music player. They didn't invent the smartphone. They didn't didn't invent anything. Anything. So 
you know, the, the greatest innovation that they had was in the user experience and in the design. And that's what made them different. If Apple had tried to be Microsoft, they would have floundered yes. and died, you know, in year zero, right? But right. they yep. did it. They focused on their race, on what their USP or whatever jargon you want to use is. Right. And, that's, and that's the same is true for, you know, again, in the arts, like no one would ever become an actor. No one would ever become a singer. No one would ever become a painter because it's all been done before, but it hasn't been done by you. And that is what is so easy to forget because previously business has, again, been part of and sort of embraced this culture of zero sum and winner take all and this right. very aggressive, competitive view where I think you and I perhaps share a more abundant view of the world. Where, yep. You know, there's always more. There's always more ideas. There's always more contributions. There is always more ways to tweak something, to add something, to deliver something a little bit differently. Yep. And so that's what I'm bringing. I'm bringing myself. I'm bringing my values. I'm bringing my vision. And it doesn't matter, you know, if it's been done before because it hasn't been done by me. Yeah, I'm with you. When I was a corporate banker, I remember thinking, oh, my gosh, the world is so big because I saw so many deals and so many yeah rich people and and thought there's just a, almost an unlimitless supply of exactly. resources to good ideas and exactly so exactly. yeah so hey let's talk publicly about one of your weaknesses and i only say that because it was right. in the book no let's do it <laughs> let's have fun um it's a weakness <laughs> of all achievers type a's and that is we want it all yeah. and uh forever it it took me to learn this lesson that I can't chase everything that I want to do, that I got to accept trade-offs. So yes. talk about trade-offs and... Oh, it is. And, well, again, you know, you, you've seen it. You've got sort of an insider uh, view into sort of my brain, I guess. But <laughs> for the longest time, again, you know, like, and I think there's an element of naivete or whatever you want to call it. But, you know, for, for a long time, it was that question of like, oh, but I want it all. And I want it all right now. And I, yeah. I you know, I'm going to be the one who does it all, you know, at the same time or whatever. By the way, you still give off that energy. So, yeah, well, That's so, a good thing. it is a good thing. And so, but, right. what, but the, the, the way I've matured it into something uh, mature and sustainable and realistic is balancing <clears throat> being content with where I'm at and what I've got without yeah. becoming complacent. Because for me, the reality is, again, there are a fixed number of hours, units of energy, dollars, whatever resource we yep. all have at our disposal. So literally, you cannot use that same resource in two different places. So, you know, every hour I'm at the gym is not an hour, is an hour I cannot spend working on my business. Every hour that I'm spending having quality time with my family is an hour I can't be spending with, you know, friends and developing those relationships. And it's just, we've been sold this myth that like we can have it all at the same time and everything has to be, you know, this idea of work-life balance. Well, actually, I don't think that is, you can, you can never balance everything perfectly. You have to choose. And there will be times where your career takes a backseat. And other things are more of a priority. There will be times when your health takes priority, when your business takes priority. Yep. We have to consciously choose and accept that, okay, right now for me, for example, my family, because I have two small kids, they're two and five, my family and my professional growth are where the majority of my resources are going yep. to be devoted. Yeah. Everything <laughs> else. Yep. has to be met with an unapologetic but still kind no yep. and and that's just life but it doesn't mean that i you know i don't see my friends or i never talk to anybody else who isn't my kids or my you know my clients it's just a realistic appreciation that we have to choose and that's that's how we build over the course of a lifetime that elusive balance or the way i like to think of it is harmony right Things will never be perfectly balanced, whatever that even looks like or, or could be. Right. But over the course of our lives, if, if it, we built this harmonious thing that, again, is in alignment with our values, what we care about, what we want our legacy to be, what, you know, all of those things, then that inevitably will mean that we are going to have to let some things go consciously and choose to focus consciously on other things that, that, that we, we are going to focus on right now. And, you know, I've written about, so we have a newsletter we send out to all of our clients. Um, yeah. And because one of the things we do with our medical company, we also teach flow science and how less is better. 
Yes. And <laughs> the way to achieve balance is to subtract. Yes. Uh, yes. Right? And, yes. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, that's how we get there. Uh, and when we try to do everything, because I have tried, my 30s was a whole decade of like, I'm going to do it all. You know, I had a business. I was a bank president while I was running my own business and just Easy crazy. One. And <laughs> at the end of the day, you don't do anything really well. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Which is that's that's what ended up causing me to go, you know what, this isn't good. I got to stop doing that. And yeah. so so let me transition here. Um, Rupa, what do you think about in terms of if you want to perform at an elite level, where do you think somebody's health plays? What what role does your health play in that? I subscribe to what sounds to many like that cliche, but if you haven't got your physical health, then nothing else will work yeah. as well as it possibly could. Right. So look, again, I'm all about being realistic because health has to be a priority. And as many of us will find, you know, if unfortunately we fall sick or we get, you know, some sort of a, a chronic illness or something, all of a sudden we're forced to make those trade-offs and those yeah, choices right. and those decisions that we wouldn't let ourselves do before. So don't wait for that to happen, I think, is the first is the first sort of uh, fundamental. And then secondly, I mean, we all, again, we know this, when we feel horrible we don't perform well we don't we don't yeah. have that spark we don't have that vitality we don't have whatever it is that fuels and look we can power through with supplements or vitamins or red bull or whatever people choose yeah. but that's yeah. not again that's not sustainable for me yeah. my view is what is sustainable because and that's why i hate things like fad diets or crash this or I you agree. know cleanses of this it has to be sustainable and it has to fit into your lifestyle so yeah. instead of creating this wholesale overhaul of like, oh, well, I'm going to just all of a sudden go from never working out to being in the gym six hours a day every day. No, yeah. that's not going to work. That's not who you are. If you yeah. were going to do that, you would have done it by now. But yeah. can you go for a walk in your lunch break? Can you decide to, you know, every time you're going to take a phone call instead of sitting at your desk, just pace around your office or go outside? What's right. small and sustainable and almost um, inobtrusive changes can you make to your sure. lifestyle to yep. start making these smaller, healthier choices a no-brainer. And so for me, some of those examples I gave are are the ones I do. It's like, when I take a phone call, I don't sit in my chair and take it. I will walk, even if I don't go outside, if it's too cold, I'll just walk in circles around my living room, you know? And, <laughs> and it's a small thing, but human beings were not meant to, we're not designed structurally no. to be sedentary beings. And right. so- any look, I get everybody is over overtaxed and overworked and exhausted and has a bazillion things, you know, with, you they know, do. pulls on their time and their energy. Yeah. So work it in in a way that works for you. Another way I do it is, you know, we've got a small daughter who whose uh, nursery is about you know two miles away. So instead of taking the car, she has to get to school or to nursery. I will walk her there and I will walk back. You know, it's yep. a small thing getting a, a job done along the way. Good to clear your head though. Wow. It clears your yeah. head. It, it's yeah. perfect for first thing in the morning because I, to my surprise, never ending surprise, am a morning person. <laughs> um, but I haven't, you know, and I've, I've tried to force myself, okay, I'm going to, you know, set a target of going to the gym five times a week and doing this. And it just has never lasted. But what does mm. last are these small and incremental changes. Yep. And, they just become what you do. It's not a thought that goes into it. And yes, I do other things to stay fit and, and maintain sure. my health, you know, yeah. but I've never become obsessive over anything. And I've been, again, goes back to honoring who I am, understanding who I am and how I work. And for me, it just has to be more incidental than not. So that's how I've built it into my, into my life. And similarly for others, again, I, your health literally is everything. You mm -hmm. cannot buy good health if you pass a certain point. And and there's this great quote that I, you know, sort of echoes in my head all the time is make food your medicine or medicine will become your food. You know, so yeah, it's right, in yeah. all of those things. It's in your movement. And and, and look, yeah. exercise has become this really lo loaded word where people feel like they're being browbeaten into doing, you know, these crazy fitness routines. Just look at it as movement. How can you move more each day? Right. Yeah. You don't have to run a marathon. You don't have to be, you know, deadlifting 600 pounds. <laughs> yeah. Just move a little bit more each day than you did the day before. And and and, and again, in the incremental, incidental ways until it becomes just another thing that you do. 
it, we have something we call the eight health habits at Tiger. And that's what we do. We do, we build them incidentally into their yeah. life using a tiny habits type methodology. Yeah. And people are amazed because we do a one-year health coaching program with them. And by the that time they get to about month seven, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm doing eight things I didn't do before. And none of it's that hard. It's all, you know, you know it's movement, it's daily yeah. breath work, it's meditation, yeah. and you can combine things and exactly. you know, eating cleanly and taking supplements, you know, doing time-restricted yeah. eating. These are the kind of things that work, you know? Yeah. And the reason I say those things is because they, what happens when it becomes incidental now it's sustainable. Exactly. You're not trying to push something big exactly. into a really limited sack, right? Exactly. So, exactly. so and, and uh, it, huh? go ahead. Sorry. No, the last thing I was going to say is that my view is that we have to at least experiment to see what fits because, yes. you know, for some people, wow. all of those eight habits, I, I imagine, will land and, and they'll it'll feel right and it'll fit right. Some might find that only four of them do or six of them do or whatever, but you have to be willing to try and then and then pay attention to what yep. is working for you yep. and what you find sustainable because all of these things as you said you know they compound and they and they build over the course of a lifetime right. over the course of a few months so even if you just chose one and stuck with it forever that you would still see benefits from it so again right. i think for me any time anyone tries to make a big wholesale overhaul of their entire lifestyle and everything it's we know it's not going to last, right? So yeah, like you said, the incremental stuff, but but be willing uh, to experiment and play around with it and 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 see what works for you. Yeah, no, spot on. It's you're right with everybody. We we have them implement them in their own unique way that works for them, right? Exactly. And exactly. So I want to get to your company now. Um, yeah. Can you talk? Just paint a picture for your your core business that's off mm -hmm. from the book because the yeah. book isn't the only business. There's a business no. behind it. Yes. So explain that and tell us, you know, who's really a good client for you? So in case somebody's listening and they, they're yes. a fit, yes. just I'll unpack that for us. So for me, it's about, it's twofold. One is working with growth mindset uh, oriented leaders. Mm -hmm. So people who are open to learning about themselves, about mm -hmm. experimenting with different ways of doing things than what they may have tried doing before, and are really and and are willing to implement the things that that come up during our time together. So mm -hmm. effectively, it's sort of executive coaching, leadership coaching, performance coaching, whatever you want to call it for yep. yeah for for people who are willing to do the work and who are willing to experiment to see with what works for them. So that can be, I work with everyone from, you know, relatively early stage um, founders all the way to corporate executives. And the, the my dream client is someone who comes with an open mind um, and, and is willing to have a conversation around what's working, what's not working. And then we work together to yep. find ways to un, un, unleash or, or tap into that potential, that identity, the things that they feel that aren't being brought out, that they want to bring out, and, and the whole sort of spectrum of, of who they are as an individual, in addition to being a leader. Um, and they're willing to, like I said, do the work because it's messy and, it, and, it, it and it's difficult and it's uncomfortable. And a lot of people run sort of, you know, screaming from even asking themselves some of these questions. Um, but at the result of doing that work, it's, it's it's transformative. It transforms your life. It yeah. transforms your business. It will transform your teams. I mean, literally it has, you know, sort of that cascade effect. So like I said, for me, it's sort of first and foremost with the leaders who are, you know, have that growth mindset and are willing to learn and do the work. And then secondly, it's, it's for organizations again, at, at, at any stage who are going through that an uncomfortable process of yep. either change or rapid growth or rapid shrinkage or you know whatever it is but there's a big change and let's face it that's pretty much every company these yeah. days or the past yeah. two years yeah, yeah. Um, but again has that that openness and that willingness to do the hard work have the difficult conversations whether it's around you know how are we hiring how are we serving our customers what are we doing well where are we you know falling victim to comparisonitis and what can you know all of those things so that mm -hmm. they can again get back on track and 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 unleash their organizational potential because the problems that i see you know companies have is you know they're good at hiring and but they're really terrible at getting the best out of their people and then mm. and and then again making that sustainable and often what happens during periods of crisis and uncertainty and change depending on how that's dealt with 
it's that thing of, you know, people st uh, sticking their, their heads in the sand of pretending the problem doesn't exist and they'll go away or not having the difficult conversations with maybe team members who aren't performing or whatever it is. And it just becomes somebody else's problem. You know, that idea of right, passing right. the buck to the next CEO or the next whatever it is. And so yep. companies who are sick of that and who are ready to just, like I said, do the work, go through the mess, but know that at the other side of it, there's going to be you know, immeasurable rewards and satisfaction and retention and all of those things. Um, but it will be messy and ugly along the way. I, I love how you just said that. I'm going to play that clip to all of our new clients when they come in. Because <laughs> uh, we tell them, you know, I love Robin Sharma. He's got some really good stuff. And he talks yeah. about changes. Uh, it's like really, you know, exciting on the beginning of it. Um, and then it's really hard. Then it gets really messy. And then it's beautiful in the end. Exactly. And so, you know, I always say, I told my kids this when they were growing up, mine are 29 and 27. And they, uh -huh. they remember this. I said, you know, the people that I want to go to battle with are the ones who get in the messy middle and they finish. Because yeah. a lot of people head for the exit in the middle. Yes. And yes. you want, you want clients that won't quit in the middle. Exactly. And, right. So. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Who are willing to test themselves and and, yeah. and like I said, do the work even when it's hardest and messiest. Yeah. Right. Uh, Rupal, um, if you could live a parallel life, here's the big <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> what would your fantasy job be? Now, maybe right now, because you're a young mom, you'd just like to be a librarian and have quiet time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only. Yeah. But uh, if you could think of one, since you've already lived this, like, life that so many people admire yeah uh, what what could be one for you uh it would be to be an, an olympic heptathlete really what's a heptathlete so uh the women uh track and field uh athletes we don't do i think men do pentathlete pen, they're pentathletes but women yeah. only do six events yeah. for whatever reason anyway um but the reason I chose that sort of uh, event or sport, whatever you want to call it, is because it is all around. And it's, again, it's all about testing your limits physically. Yep, and yep, yep. Um, you, know, you have to have well-balanced upper body as well as lower body strength for the sprinting, for the long distance, for the javelin, yep. for all of those things. Um, and I, for me, again, in the, in the realm of sort of testing ourselves and, and pushing ourselves, what the human body is physically capable of Amazing. is it just never stops to I mean really just astound me and 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 just awe me you know yeah. and yeah. I'm one of those people who watches world championships who watches Olympics who watches the World Cup I mean I love a good sporting event because of just the sheer physical prowess <laughs> of the people mm -hmm. involved the excellence, yeah. It's exactly, the excellence and the pushing yeah. yourself and the having the adversity and having the physical adversity and having the setbacks where you've got an ACL injury and, you know, at the day of the meet or your hamstring gets you know, pulled on, you know, while you're running the 200 or whatever it is, right? And 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 the, it's the agony and the ecstasy and all yeah, of that. Yeah. <laughs> but for me, it's the just the pushing the physical limits of what we can do. I, I would absolutely love to do that. So your assignment after this is to think yes. about how that shows up in your life already. And yeah, uh, well, I, I, I already know the answer to that because <laughs> I, you know, I love, um, I love, a, I love a good physical challenge. You know, I've set myself a challenge to be able, for example, this year to be able to do ten chin ups uh, without oh, stopping, wow, and, good. I, and I've already got to eight, so I've got two more to go with a good few months left. Yeah, um, you know, I want to be able to do splits before I turn fifty. So I've got a whole training program. You know, there. there that's not things. on my list. Yeah. No. Well, it's. Not, I mean, it's a weird thing, but it's again, it's just, it's a challenge. It's something yeah. very defined, and it's. I know yep. when I have done it, and you know, and there are programs and things, and so, and yeah, I, I like, I like being physical. I like being strong. I like, um, yes. I like pushing my my personal limits. Obviously, right now, well, ever there'll never be Olympic level, but. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's that's how I think it shows up for me. That's really cool. Um, I love asking ask, asking that question because it, it's it, a great it, everybody is so different. Yeah. And, um, so, Rupal Patel, thank you for being on the Tiger Performance Podcast. And um, this book, uh, you can see it here on the video. Yeah. From CIA to CEO is available on Amazon and everywhere else you can look for a book. I yep. personally endorse it. 
with 35 years of experience as a leader, this book was one of the best ones I've read on leadership in a long time. Uh, wow! And uh, I would encourage people to get it. Uh, and where can they find you if they heard? Now, our show notes people are phenomenal. They're going to get everything here that you say, and it'll be in there. Yep. And we will get it out on social media and our YouTube channel, but we'll give it to you too Amazing. to share with your list. Yep. How do they find you, Ripple? It's super easy. Um, if you're a LinkedIn person, you can find me on LinkedIn, um, or you can just come to my website, which is rupalypatel.com. So R-U-P-A-L-Y-P-A-T-E-L.com. You got it. Got it. Yeah. Thank you for being on the, on the Tiger Performance Podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure, Steve. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Tiger Performance Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get the future episodes.